In August 2018, the govern government of New Zealand passed legis legislation cracking down on a surge of foreigners buying property. Do you remember hearing about that? Some of you probably do. One reason for the high demand is the mounting global anxiety about the increase of natural disasters and political turmoil plaguing the globe. Some of the world's richest people are seeking to build luxury bunkers in New Zealand, which is considered, you have to excuse me just a moment, my eyes are kind of going unfocused for, I have this once in a while, everything starts going like that. Anyway, to get on with it, it, it talks about how much money is being spent. These folks are building uh, what we used to call back in the 50s, what was that? Maybe some of you remember? Bunkers, yeah. So these folks are spending quite a bit of money. Some of, them, some of these bunkers that they're building there, let's see, they have a swimming pool. And there are, I think they said up 13 or 30, 13 feet below the surface. They have bowling alleys, uh, a media room, backup batteries. But it says, however, if you're looking for this kind of first class survival shelter, it will set you back about 11 0.5 million dollars. I'm going to go out tomorrow and buy me one of those, aren't you? <laughs> Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you again for the opportunity to be here in your house. And we would ask that your Holy Spirit and your angels would be here. Your Holy Spirit to guide my mouth, that all that I say will be a blessing, Lord and glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever experienced a tribulation? Considering the headlines these days, you might feel as if you're in the middle of one right now. And no doubt we are living in very interesting times. Every day it seems there's another scary crisis in the news. Whether it's the COVID, And I think the number is up just in the United States has went over 500,000 people right now have died. That's a half a million people, folks. My wife and I know 14 personally. The youngest was seven. The oldest was 87. And they were all over the spectrum between there that passed away from this. A lot of people are not taking this very serious. I'm glad they got the vaccine. Have any of you had your vaccine yet? My wife and I had our first shot. We're due to have our second next month. But then we look around at everything else that's going on. I have never in my 80 years of life seen, number one, this COVID thing being worldwide, a pandemic like this. I have never seen so many people that are so full of hate, people shooting people, uh, our own government representatives cannot get along. Have you noticed that? They're at each other's throat. There's, I don't see any love out there, folks. Do you? Satan is really alive and well, but his time is short. There's massive wildfires, there's hurricanes. Uh, Texas just got hit with a big snowstorm and a lot of people without electricity. Uh, my wife and I, a few years ago, uh, living up in Washington State on the eastern part where we do get snow, we were without power for two weeks one time. Uh, how do you get along in those situations? You just have to do what you have to do, right? 
We had an electric furnace, so we didn't have heat. At that time, we didn't have our wood stove, which later I says we're getting a wood stove, which we did. So we had no heat, and it got pretty cold. We didn't really need the refrigerator in the house because it was cold enough to leave your food out. It would keep it fresh. So, but anyway, we, uh, at night, we would bundle up and grab every piece of clothing we could find before we went to bed to keep warm. And we're told that we should press together. My wife and I were pressing together during those times, absorbing each other's body heat. But it was kind of a rough time. But we had a little camp stove, and we had a kerosene lanterns, and we got along. You know, we can survive, folks. Uh, so we're inundated with news of major troubles. That is tribulation. Some even believe that things are so bad, we're at the threshold of an apocalyptic event in time the Bible calls the Great Tribulation. While different denominations debate the timing for this period, virtually all churches agree those living on the earth in the last days will experience a great tribulation. And most believers look upon it with different degrees of apprehension. With that in mind, I am not sharing this information to frighten you. I don't lose any sleep worrying about the Great Tribulation, do you? But suppose your family were taking a rafting trip. Wouldn't you want the river guide to tell you about any rough rapids that were ahead? So you could be prepared to hang on to the ropes? Well, in Matthew 24, you all got your Bibles out because we're going to be hitting the Bible here just real fast. In Matthew 24, we're going to be looking at that. And we're all very familiar with Seventh-day Adventists about Matthew 24. But here we find the disciples and Jesus discussing the Jewish temple. One of the Lord's statements certainly shocked his followers, and we find that in Matthew 24, verse 2. And Jesus said unto them, See, not, see ye not all of these things? Verily I say unto you. I gave a sermon one time. You ever notice the verilies? There's sometimes it's verily, and sometimes it's verily, verily. I think we need to really pay attention when he uses those words, verily. Verily, I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. I don't know if you realize this or not, folks, but do you know how much some of those stones weighed in that building? 150, not pounds, tons, 150 tons. The idea that one stone be left upon another is flabbergasting. This prompted the disciples to pry from Jesus deeper details. Matthew 24, you're there, verse 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? That was kind of a loaded question. There's a lot of, there's more than one question there, isn't there? When's this, in other words, when's the temple going to be tore down. And they were kind of thinking that would be the end of time. And the other was when the sign of the times. The Lord put it all together here as we read on. Verse 4, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all of these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. 
For nations shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. You know, we're told in one place in the spirit of prophecy that in her time, in the church itself, one in 20 were ready for the Lord's coming. Wow. Isn't that scary, folks? Count around and see how many people we got in here. One in 20. Oh, we, we need to be close to the Lord. Now we're back. Verse 13, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Amen. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. How far do you think we are away from that, folks? I think we pretty well got the work done. We're real close. When you shall therefore see the abomination of desolation spoken of, of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Oh, there's still the Sabbath there. That's one of the great texts for these folks out there that don't know about that. In the future, he's talking about the, the Sabbath still. For then you shall be great, for then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days shall be shortened, there shall be no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Thank you, Lord, for that. Notice the wording in verse 21. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. Think about that. There's going to be tribulation. I mean, wasn't the flood bad enough? I mean, there's been some bad tribulation over the years, but it says this is going to be even worse, huh? The language is used as breathtaking, isn't it? Those words frighten many people. I remember the church was being filled with anxious people on the weekend following 9-11. They had seen these horrible images of buildings imploding in downtown New York. They never dreamed this kind of calamity could come to America's shores. But truth be told, that event pales in comparison to the bombing of Dresden, the siege of Stalingrad. Have any of you ever read about that? What the Germans did there and the, the number of lives that were lost in Stalingrad? And consider Pearl Harbor and the atrocities of the Holocaust. I remember walking on the Arizona in Honolulu there and there's still 1,100 people in the hull of that ship there that are there until the Lord comes. Still there that died in that ship. Think about the monstrous tsunamis that hit Indonesia or Japan. And what about the Black Death and the Dark Ages? There have been so many horrific events in history 
a relentless stream of great tribulations. Many times the things we worry about don't actually end up being so bad. You ever notice that? Hindsight, you look back, oh, that wasn't so bad. When you're going through it, it wasn't a lot of fun, was it? But later you look back and you say, well, that wasn't so bad. Most of the pain is found in the anxiety and anticipation. But in the case of the great tribulation, you cannot over-imagine how bad it will be. Jesus said regarding this time, unless those days be shortened, no flesh would be saved. In other words, without God's intervention, nothing would survive. It's important for us to note that there are really four different types of tribulation encompassed in Matthew 24. A tribulation applied to Israel, a tribulation of the church, a global final tribulation, and a personal tribulation. Obviously, when Jesus said there wouldn't be one stone left upon another in the temple, he was talking about the fall of Jerusalem and the literal destruction of the temple. This is the first tribulation, the one that profoundly affected the nation of Israel. The historian Josephus tells us that 1.1 million Jews died when the Romans sacked Jerusalem in 70 AD. 1.1 million. But then his prophecy comes broader, more comprehensive. There is also a tribulation that especially afflicted the New Testament church. Verse 9 says, They will deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and you will be hated of all nations for my name's sake. That phrase, all nation, implies a global persecution. In Revelation 11, you can turn there, Revelation 11 speaks of a specific time of this tribulation. And I'm going to be quoting from the last part of 11, Revelation 11, verse 2. And the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. As good Adventists, we all know what this is. Since a Jewish month has 30 days, 42 months equals 1,260 days, which in prophetic terms equals 1,260 years. And once again, this prophecy was precisely fulfilled. The pure church was ground down and oppressed by spiritual Babylon during this vast age, the time of great papal persecution. From A.D. 538, when the papacy gained military power, to 1798, when it temporarily lost its political power because of Napoleon. For 1260 years, those faithful to God and his commandments fled into the wilderness. These dark ages were a time of intense tribulation. Historians estimate somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 million Christians and Jews that were killed in various campaigns like the Inquisition over this span of time. With this background, what is the great tribulation of the last days? Simply put, it's the seven last plagues. Revelation, you're still there? Go to 16, verse 1. Revelation 16, verse 1. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, seven angels, excuse me, go your ways and pour out the vials of wrath of God upon, wrath of God upon the earth. Scripture goes on to describe men being scorched by great heat and afflicted with sores because they worship the beast. 
The waters of earth are turned to blood. When Jesus says it will be a time like there never has been, he is quoting from the book of Daniel. And this is our scripture reading from this morning. You can turn there again if you would like. Daniel 12, verses 1 and 2. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, with standards for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble. There it is. Such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, when? At that time, thy people shall be lit, delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. From the reference to the book of life and the resurrection, we can see that this passage applies to the church and the mark of the beast in time tribulation occurring just before the second coming. Daniel tells us that Michael, who I believe to be the Old Testament term for the Messiah, stands up at that time. You know, when a judge is in session, He's sitting down. When it's over, the gavel hits the wood and he stands up. It's done. When the judge hits the gavel, stands up, it means the case is closed. With judgment concluded, Michael stands up to come and rescue his people. Folks, I tell you something, I believe we are very close to that time right now. We haven't seen the last uh, seven plagues yet, but believe me, I think what we've just seen is a precursor with this COVID. But there's no other impl implication, the closing of probation. Oh, excuse me, there's another implication. I should have worn my other glasses. There's another implication, the closing of probation. What do I mean? There will be a period of time just before Jesus returns when the lost cannot be saved. Life will go on, but the saved are saved and the lost are lost. You can look that up later today, Revelation 22, 11. While God is patient with all people, it's possible to reach a point of no return. Consider that Jesus said the end of time will be as it was in Noah's day. When Noah stood at the entrance of the ark and made his final appeal, nobody but his family responded. He then went inside and the door was shut by God. The Bible says that life went on for the doomed souls outside of the ark. Their probation had closed, yet they still got up for the next seven days, eating, drinking, building, marrying, and laughing at Noah, unaware that it was too late. Likewise, there will be a similar period of time near the end when probation has closed, but life goes on. Before the great tribulation of the end time, before the seven last plagues, there will be a small time of trouble, a testing time, during which a law will be passed that you cannot buy or sell unless you bear the mark of the beast. You can look that up in Revelation 13, but we're not gonna do it right now. From there, problems will escalate until those who refuse to worship the beast are threatened with death. Once probation closes, I don't believe there's going to be any more martyrs, but there may be some put to death for their conviction during that small time of trouble. Indeed, there are Christians dying for their faith in many parts of the world today. 
The small time of trouble will involve persecution through religious laws. Many will flee from the great centers of population when the abomination of desolation occurs. When our freedom to worship according to the commands of the one true God will be taken away. At this time, apostate Protestantism will join papal Rome in sponsoring laws that tell us how and whom to worship. Many people question whether the United States could actually sink to this level of religious persecution. But as we've seen historically, when people are afraid, they're willing to sacrifice freedom for some illusion of security. When severe problems strike, people also look for someone to blame. In this case, the majority will believe that God is punishing the planet because of the insubordinate, insubordinate minority. Those who refuse to cooperate will be seen as religious fanatics and will become obvious targets. Do you know who that's going to be? If we're faithful, that's going to be us. I can easily see how all of this can unfold, can't you? I can really see it. And just the way the world is going right now, it's coming, folks. Many of us who have lived a few years can honestly say, I've gone through tribulation. We all experience major troubles in this life. For you, it might be a health problem, a serious family issue, a financial crisis, or you might have lived in a country that's been at war. I know one here that can relate to that, right, Anne? And lived in uh, Holland there during the, when the Russians or the G Germans came in there and took Holland over. She got to see that. She was a young lady at the time. But perhaps the biggest tribulation you and I face occurs within our hearts. Turn with me to Ephesians. We're going to be looking at chapter 6 and verse 12. That's Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. I still hear a few pages rustling. I'll wait till you get there. Okay. Ephesians 6, 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We all know this one. But against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You know, I have personally uh, been attacked by these rulers of the darkness. I think I shared that one time at, before with some of you folks after a Bible study where Satan was there. I had gone home and uh, laid down in bed and all of a sudden this darkness was there. What had happened, I was given a Bible study and I looked down the hallway and I saw and the, the, the lady I was studying with had two kids and she had just put them to bed and she was sitting to my left. I was here in the hallway. Was, I could see down there. And all of a sudden I saw this being go from one room to the other. It was just a dark figure because there were no lights in there. And I asked her, I says, is somebody else here? She says, no, just me and the kids. I said, well, I just saw somebody or something going from one room to the other. Oh, that. Well, yeah, we've kind of had to put up with that. And so, well, I'd been around that feeling before, and I said, well, we need to pray about that, which we did. But as I went home and I was laying in bed, I just got down in bed, laid back, went to sleep. All of a sudden, this darkness 
came upon me. I felt a heaviness on my chest. I tried to speak. I couldn't speak. I knew who it was. It was Satan and his angels. What do we do? You pray. I couldn't speak, but the Lord still hears my thoughts, doesn't he? I said, in the name of Jesus Christ, get thou behind me, Satan. And just like that, it was gone. I could breathe again, but I tell you, Satan is alive and well, and we, we're in a battle with him. We do, if you aren't, you better check what you're doing in your life. He's alive and well, but he's, we know how the book ends. His life is short, okay? The greatest tribulation of the life of Christ was probably the Garden of Gethsemane just before the cross. His suffering was so intense, his sweat was, were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. But what happened? Jesus fully surrendered to the will of the Father, praying three times, take this away from me, but not my will be done, but yours, okay? The surrender of self, the surrender of what? Did any of you have to battle with self? Isn't, it, isn't that horrible? I mean, we were baptized, and the old man's supposed to be dead. And we were raised up into a new life. But still, we keep resurrecting that old self at times, don't we? The surrender of self is the greatest tribulation faced by believers. The apostle described the battle in this way, Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12 and verse 4. If you, ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Jesus sweated blood for you and I. Have we come to that point in our life yet? Are we willing to sweat blood for him? Are we willing to die for him? Are you willing to do that? We all experience tribulations that we could have prefer, we would prefer to avoid, but at the same time, tribulation produces character. Romans 5, verse 3 and 4. And while you're turning there, let's see, I think I had something in my Bible. I write all kinds of things in my Bible here. Revelation, or Romans 5, verses 3 and 4. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. Some translations of the Bible use the word character, where it says experience in the King James. Do you want hope? Do you want character? You can actually rejoice in tribulations because these qualities are produced by troubles. So when we have things befall us, what do we do? And say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for bringing, there's something that still he sees in me that he wants to develop. When trials come, I mean, are, are you quick to anger when something happens sometimes? Uh, we got to get rid of that, folks. And I'm probably one of the worst offenders, okay? I have trouble with temper at times, but those are things the Lord, you know, we need to get rid of these things. We need to be loving and kind. And, and uh, oh. Well, I'm going to have to keep get going here. I get carried away and go on side stories all the time. So, Do you want to be found pure when Jesus comes? It's through tribulations and the trials we experience that our hearts are made ready. We must pray, Lord, not my will, 
that thy will be done. Nowhere in scripture are we taught that God will just vacuum up his people before the great tribulation. There are so many people out there in the Christian world that have been fooled by this. They've been told, oh yeah, you'll be just taken up. No, you're not going to be taken up. You'll be taken up, yeah, after you went through it. Acts 14, verse 22. Confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation. Through what? It doesn't say just tribulation, but it says much tribulation, folks. Can you say amen to that? It's kind of hard to say amen to that one, isn't it? Much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. We must through much tribulation. Does God promise to have his church, to save his church from tribulation or through tribulation? Through tribulation. It's an important distinction. Did God save Noah from the flood or did he save him through the flood? Through the flood. Did God save the three young Hebrews from the fiery furnace or did he save them through the furnace? I don't know about you, but I sure wouldn't want to be. I mean, the guys that threw him in were burned up and died. It was that hot. But that they came out with unsinged clothes. Even their clothes were unsinged. And no smell of the smoke. But the Son of Man was in there with them. Wow. The children of Israel were in Egypt when the plagues fell. But God saved them through the plagues. He didn't snatch away any of these people before these crises happened. That might sound scary, but look closely. It's also why you don't need to fear the seven last plagues. God makes a promise. I, I just love, turn to Psalms 91. That's one of my favorite Bible texts, Psalms 91. I mean, Take time this afternoon and just read that whole psalm. But we're going to be looking at verse 10. Psalms 91, verse 10. I love this promise. There shall be no evil. How much evil? Zipperuni, folks. That much. Befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. That's a wonderful promise. Take a hold of it. But while I'm not worried about the plagues, I do not want to make, I do want to make sure that any tribulation that comes into my life before then prepares me so that I'm ready for the tribulation. Thus, the key to surviving the great, great tribulation is to al allow God to transform you now. If you're faithful in little tribulations that come in the fiery trials you go through, saying, Lord, purify me, purge me, whatever you need to do, Lord. That's a hard prayer, folks. Whatever you need to do, if you embrace those things that humble you now, if you are willing to learn the lessons of righteousness, he will prepare you. You'll have nothing to fear from that great tribulation. Indeed, your faith will be strengthened as you see the prophecy being fulfilled. I imagine when we start seeing those first things, Lord, this is it. We're here. Those last seven plagues are falling now on the earth. We know it can't be long now. You're going to be coming back in the clouds of heaven to pick us up and take us with you. Ah, I remember hearing a story about a wagon train of settlers. I always like to have a little story. It kind of makes you remember things a little better, doesn't it? Isn't that the way Jesus taught? I remember hearing a story about a wagon train of settlers who were crossing the Great Plains and heading west. And as they were going across, they looked off into a distance and they saw 
smoke. The grass was about four feet high. And have you ever seen grass burn, or a grass fire? It goes fast, doesn't it? Woo. So the people started, saw that. They started getting, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? The wagon leader said, give me three or four guys and we'll put ourselves behind us. The, the wind was coming towards them. He says, and we'll light a fire behind us. They lit a fire behind. It took off and burnt. The fire was coming, got closer. He said, everybody take the wagons, horses, cattle. Everybody move into this place that's burnt. They all moved into there. The children cried as they saw approaching the approaching wildfire, but their parents reassured them, the fire cannot hurt us now because we're standing where it has already burned. The flames roared around them. Are there going to be flames roaring around us? Yes, there are. But other than some annoying smoke, they were safe. You don't have to worry, folks, about the trouble of the last days if God has already purged everything that's flammable in your life. But you must allow him to do that work. Our only safety comes through putting our faith in him. More important, if you are abiding in Christ, he has already taken the wrath of the Father upon himself on your behalf. To be prepared for the great tribulation we need to face with faith the fiery storms that come into our lives now and embrace the things that transform us into the image of Christ. Jesus assures us that if we remain in him, we can be of good courage through any tribulation because he has already overcome the world. Is that home that you prepared for us over there? I would ask that you would be with every one of us here that has gathered today here in your house, that you would guide and not one be missing, Lord, when you come to take us home. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.